forever. He's not going to change his mind. He doesn't love us one day and not the next. His love endures forever.
to the King. God, we thank you and we praise you for the great truths that we get to celebrate, especially during this season. And Father, we recognize that what we celebrate at, at Christmas, although at times we can get wrapped up in a lot of things that aren't about the truth of what you've done for us, God, Christmas is about a Savior that was sent into this world, a, a sinless Savior who has come to set people free from their sins. Father, may we walk through this season with that at the forefront of our minds and our actions and everything that we do. And Father, for that gift that you've given us through Jesus, we recognize that you alone are worthy to be praised. You alone are worthy of our worship and our adoration today and every day. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. You can go ahead and say hello. Greet someone around you. This morning, welcome them to Grace Gospel. Good morning, church. Good. good morning, good morning. So happy to see all of you this morning. We want to welcome you to Grace Gospel Church. We're glad that you are here. Uh, there's a welcome card in every seat pocket in front of you. And uh, so if you are new with us, if you're a guest with us this morning, or if you just have some information to update, 
uh, for our system. You can fill out that card and uh, place it in one of our offering boxes. There's one up on the front wall and then one on the back wall uh, as you leave after service this morning. And uh, what filling out that card will do, it will plug you into our, our weekly newsletter that we send out uh, each and every Wednesday just to keep you in the know on all things happening at Grace Gospel Church and uh, all the ministries and events that we have upcoming. All right, so uh, we do want to show our uh, movie trailer for The Star. Uh, we're showing a movie here next Sunday uh, at 4 p.m., uh, free admission, popcorn, beverages, everything. And so here is that trailer for you. This holiday season, witness the story of the first Christmas through a whole new set of eyes. It's the wise men. Hide quickly. Oh. Ah. The other to the other left. Oh. Deborah. Are you okay? How many hooves am I holding up? <sighs> from the studio that brought you miracles from heaven and cloudy with a chance of meatballs, meet the unlikely heroes behind the greatest story ever told. Herod is up to something. Mary needs help. We need to save her. You're in danger. You need to listen to what I'm about to say extremely carefully. <laughs> Do you want a belly rub? <sighs> If you want to get to my friends, you're going to have to get past me first. What is that? What? what? That wasn't supposed to look, was it? Donkey King! Dave. I'm going to go find someone to poop on. No, too big, too big. Ruth. Almost down. One more chasm. Uh-oh. Well, didn't exactly see the landing, but that was good. Dave! I'm under you and in a lot of pain. And Deborah, Cyrus, and Felix. The new king's in danger. Run for your life! Get out of the way! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah! Here's a little well-placed distraction. <laughs> the star. Ugh. Ow! Wait a second, are they eating chicken? Ladies, run! All right, I mean, why would you not want to come see that movie? All right, come on. 4 p.m., it's free, all right? Uh, and, I mean, come on, come on. It's the star, you got to come see it. Sunday, 4 o'clock, uh, kids, beg your parents to come on out for that. There's cupcakes, popcorn, candy, goodies, all of that. Uh, you can come dressed in your Christmas pajamas, whatever you want to do. Uh, come on out next Sunday, 4 o'clock, to see uh, the star. And uh, so with that, kids, you're now dismissed to go ahead down uh, for Super Church, uh, kindergarten through second grade, third grade through sixth grade. Uh, you can go on down for Super Church. All right, just a few other announcements this morning. So... Uh, our annual meeting is today after service. Uh, lunch uh, with pizza will be provided and uh, child care provided as well. So uh, plan on sticking around for our annual meeting. It'll be starting uh, pretty quickly after service concludes uh, this morning. Uh, if you call Grace Gospel Home, you're definitely going to want to be a part of our annual meeting today. So plan on sticking around. And then uh, next Friday, the 15th, uh, we're having a Christmas worship night uh, with 180. Uh, we're also collecting unwrapped toys uh, for, a, for kids uh, 0 through 17 years old, all right, to benefit families uh, in need this Christmas season. And so you can bring uh, a toy with you as well. Uh, but come on out for sure for the Christmas worship night this Friday uh, at 7 o'clock with 180. Very much looking forward to that. And then I'm going to invite Pastor Patrick to come and uh, give us an update on our Christmas Eve services coming up in a couple weeks. All right. So just uh, I just want to let you guys know for that movie night, so it's not a kid's movie. It's a family movie night. So you adults who are like, well, I want to come, but I can't come because my kids are too old. You can come. Because it's a family time. So you can join me. And as we watch the, the true story of how it actually happened. <laughs> Obviously, it's just going to be fun, right? It's just going to be a fun night. It's going to be a fun movie. So come on out. Enjoy it. Really, seriously. I mean, anybody can come. Even adults, if you want to wear your Christmas jammies, you can do that too. Okay? Nobody will judge you. 
All right, well, we might judge you a little bit, but not much. All right? It'll be all good. So uh, the other thing is I get to uh, let you know about the things that are happening Christmas. So it's really cool this year. Uh, last year, Christmas fell on uh, a Sunday, and so we did worship on Sunday because we always worship on Sunday. We do not cancel Sunday morning services uh, for any reason. Um, and so this year, Christmas Eve is on uh, Christmas Christmas Eve is on Sunday morning, and so we'll have a Sunday morning service, our regular Sunday morning service at 10 a.m., and then that night we'll be doing a Christmas Eve candlelight service, which is just an awesome service. If you have never been to that, man, I just would encourage you to come. It's a great way uh, to really kind of dive in and to worship our Savior, and I challenged you a few weeks ago to just think about that and, and think about making that a priority. Danielle and I when we first got married, before I was ever a pastor or even thinking about being a pastor, we uh, had just committed to God that we would always, um, Christmas Eve would be his, right? We, we, you know, that's, that was our tradition to worship on Christmas Eve. That was what our church did. And so we were going to go worship God. And so we want to invite you to that. Um, that's at 7 o'clock Christmas Eve, which is the 24th, in case you're wondering. All right. Um, great time last you know, hour, hour and 15 minutes, just a really special time, uh, and you will love it, I promise you, on that. Now, if you don't have family in the area or you're not busy that night, um, what Danielle and I have done for most of the last 33 years of our marriage, because we've committed to Christmas Eve, is, you know, dinner, what do we do? So we have hors d'oeuvres, and so that has morphed into not even just this church, the last church. Uh, hors d'oeuvres at 5.30 p.m., so an hour and a half before. So downstairs, uh, we're going to do a time of hors d'oeuvres. We ask that you just bring something to share. Uh, that's our dinner, is the hors, d'oeuvres, the hors d'oeuvres that night. And so uh, we invite you to come join us, with us. So the pastors will be there, the Van Camps and the McCartys will definitely be there. And so if you, like I said, if you're, if you're with family, hey, praise the Lord, right? And uh, if you want to invite the family, that's fine. Just bring extra hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> So, um, but that's at 5.30. There is a sign up in the back for that. And so we would just love for you to join us in that time. It's a great time. Okay? So Christmas is coming. Uh, two weeks away, believe it or not. Two weeks from tomorrow. So um, do not leave service early to go shopping. Um, so, or the meeting. Right? We'll feed you lunch, have a meeting, then you can go shopping. Okay. All right. And you should go shopping sooner than later because crazy. I'm going to pray because we're going to go before God in his word. Father, I love you so much. I thank you for your grace and mercy and love and joy, all that you give us, all that we are in you. Father, you are awesome. And I just thank you for, for what you do. I thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. And Father, I just pray that you would meet us at this time. Would you come... Um, and just help us to, to meet you here, Lord, um, in this place before you uh, to your glory. Um, I love you so much, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. While I was praying, God reminded me of something, and that is. So uh, yesterday morning, this place looked extremely different than what it looked today. Um, as a matter of fact, what it looked like at 2 o'clock yesterday afternoon. And that was, I'm just going to say, man, we had an amazing time yesterday. Ladies did a great job uh, organizing it. Men, you did an amazing job serving as usual. Um, yeah, I, you clap for the men, but not for, I don't know, don't go figure. Um, it is just awesome. So you guys were, were great. Michaela spoke, and if you were not here, ladies, you missed an amazing uh, message. It was great. Um, God is, uh, a young woman can talk, and so I look forward to seeing what God, <laughs> I didn't mean it that way, <laughs> all right, she can talk for the Lord, that's what I meant, <laughs> my goodness, but she did a great job, it was, it was a great time, um, and keep praying, so um, I believe an eternal thing happened yesterday. I know in some people's lives it did as they transferred from death into life. Praise the Lord. Yeah, amen. That's, that's worthy of praising God for. 
right? There are other women who were challenged and kind of getting closer. So I, I like to, part of our, and I'll, I'll do this later in our meeting, but, you know, in everything we do, we want to move people closer to Jesus, even if they don't know him at all. So if they're a negative five on the scale and Jesus is the zero, you know, where they come to salvation, even if we can move them from a negative five to a negative four, that's what we want to do. Right? And that's why we do this every year. You know, even some of those women have come year after year after year, right? Hopefully, we're just moving them up the scale to one day for them to come to Jesus and then up the scale more as they get to know him. Everything we do is about that, right? Nothing for entertainment purposes only, um, including the movie. (laughs) We want to get them into our church, let them have fun, enjoy, laugh, and then invite them to Christmas Eve. So, all right? So, anyway... Great job. Church, I mean, it was a great example of the family of God coming together. It wasn't one person. It wasn't three people. It was a lot of people coming together to do a lot of things, and it meshed well. Good job, Grace. Thank you, guys. All right. Radical, right? That's what we're talking about. Radical Christianity. Praise the Lord. Um, But... But both Janice and Troy were like, you know, you got to do something for Christmas, don't you? I mean, you can't just do, you know, I mean, radical Christianity, that's a great theme. And so, um, you know, we got to do something in this Advent season because we're in this Advent season. And so we're going to do radical Christmas. <laughs> like that? There you go. <laughs> Boom. Look at that. And it really is radical because, in a way, if you grab Christ, it changes everything, and it'll change your view of Christmas um, amazingly. And if, and if you're saying to me, well, no, really, I viewed Christmas the same from before Christ to after Christ, uh, you have not, you're not capturing all that Christmas is and all that it should be. And so um, that's what we get to talk about. We get to talk about in this season, it's not, we're going to talk about our response, our radical response to a radical rescue, right? We talked several weeks ago about what Jesus Christ did in this radical way that he saved us, that he came for us, that he came down. We're, we're celebrating that now, him invading our reality and our humanity so that he might come not to just live and hang out with us, but ultimately so that he could die and take upon himself our sins to become a replacement for us for God's wrath. Praise the Lord. And so what does that mean for us? And as we have talked about already so far, right, we have been bought with a price, and and there demands a response. We talked a few weeks ago about that Jesus wants it all. He wants everything. He, He requires a radical sacrifice in response to his radical sacrifice for us. And that radical sacrifice is that we give it all to him. You might remember a few weeks ago I said, God doesn't want to be your label. He wants to be your life. He doesn't want just an addition to God. That's not, Christmas isn't about Jesus coming and it gives me something extra to do and maybe even a little bit something more with a little bit more meaning in it. He wants to invade us personally. As a matter of fact, the gift of Christmas very much so is that God can be with us and in us, right? That was the mystery that Paul preached. Christ in you, the hope of glory, invading our lives. God doesn't want to be a label. I like what um, Howard Hendricks said, quoting another uh, person from a book. He said this, um, Chad Walsh, in in a book, quoted this. He said, millions of Christians live in a sentimental haze of vague piety with soft uh, organ music trembling in a lovely light from stained glass windows. Their religion is a pleasant thing of emotional quiver divorced from intellect, divorced from the will, and demanding little except lip service to a few harmless platitudes. And then Hendrick said this. He said, I suspect that Satan has called off his attempt to convert people to agnosticism. After all, if a person travels far enough away from Christianity, he or she is always in danger of seeing it in perspective and deciding that it is true. It is much safer from Satan's point of view to vaccinate a person with a mild case of Christianity so as to protect them from the real disease. Interesting quote, right? I like it. 
Um, a lot of us too often, not, a lot of, lot of, not us, hopefully not us, right, but a lot of people that sit in churches even this morning have been inoculated with a mild case of Christianity. And uh, we like the warm glow of it. We just don't like, you know, anything more than that. You know, that, that, that's too radical for us of what you require for us, and yet that's what God does. So what happens? So what do we need? In order to, you know, we talked a few weeks ago about this radical sacrifice that we need to make to him, which is to give everything to him, to lay it all out on the altar, a living sacrifice to God. We talked about faith last week and about the fact that if we don't have faith, we can't please God. But faith isn't seeing. Faith is believing God at his word and walking in that and actually living your life in response to that, choosing how you go in, 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 in light of his promises, not because of what practically works. Most of us are pragmatic in our Christianity. Well, if it works, it's good, and if it doesn't work, it's not good. In other words, what I mean by works is whether it makes me feel good, makes me look good, gives me more, helps me to have peace, helps me not to have trouble, then that is all good. But if I'm going to have trouble at all, well, then that can't be. That's asking too much. You want me to trust God in the midst of that? But that's what God asks of us. So how do, we, how do we do it? Well, in a sense, the world has it right, although it has it wrong. Finish, finish somebody, if not everybody, well, all of you, some of you older, finish this for me. What the world needs now is love, is love. Ah, look at that. You heathens. <coughs> you know this. Anyway. <laughs> Right, that was a popular song. All of you young people are going, I have no idea what the heck they are doing. Um, believe it or not, though, that song's been recorded over 100 times by 100, by 100 different artists, I'm sure, sorry, uh, over the years, over the many years that it has been out. And, and it is right. What the world needs now is love. That's what it needs. The problem is, is that we have this wrong idea about what that means. Right? We think it's seeking after somebody to make me whole or to make me purposeful or something like that. Or, or we, we tend to think that it maybe is just a, a little bit of something, but that's not what it is. Jesus is calling us to a radical love, a radical love. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Mark, chapter 12. As we talk about this radical love of what God wants from us, we sang about his radical love this morning of dying for us, right? Amazing love. How can it be that God would die for us, right? That God would would, would step into our space, into our place, and die for us. That's amazing in his love for us. Praise God. So our love for him, again, needs to be complete in what we give. So let me set the scene here. In in Mark chapter 12, what we see is we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're, 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 they're getting really tired of Jesus at this point in his ministry. They're tired because people are following them and listening to him, and 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 their influence is lessening. They're jealous. And they really don't like it because he's taking them away from religion to a relationship with God. And they don't like that. And so they're trying to throw him off publicly so that he trying to get him to say something that might, you know, put him in a weird place that people would go, oh, wait, oh, I don't, I don't want to follow him. You know what I mean? So they, they've tried. It's not working. You know, they try to ask him different kind of questions. And then finally, verse 28, chapter 12, it says this. One of the scribes, one of the Sadducees, come up to him. He said, and, and, and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well on these other questions, he asked them this question. He says, what commandment is foremost of all? So, it's interesting. The, the Pharisees had, I think, 614 commandments, a bunch of negative, a bunch of positive ones. That was extra scribal stuff, you know, that they had written into the law, right? All kinds of, of different kinds, of, I'm sorry, different commandments that have been given, plus the, on top of that, the, 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 the Pharisaical law, I'm sorry. Um, 
So all kinds of things. Like out of all the Bible, Jesus, I mean, if you want to put controversy in there, let me figure out which is the, you know, let's get people arguing. That's what we want to do. We want to get people arguing around Jesus. We want to debate. And I'm going to tell you, um, although there are times to defend Jesus and the gospel very clearly, um, we do not need to go to debate season most of the time. I just, I just a firm believer. I'm just sharing the gospel. I don't need to beat you down with it. So um, Jesus says, what's the foremost of all? And he says this, verse 29. He says, the foremost is here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And he says, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He said, there is no other commandment greater than these. So, I know it's going to sound simple, as all of it does in what we've been preaching, but it's not so. So, the first thing he wants is he wants a radical love for God, or of God from us. A radical love of God. I love it. Jesus has asked this question, and it doesn't appear in the text and again, I get sometimes time-wise, but I don't think he thinks about it. He knows exactly what is the foremost commandment, right? He doesn't need to mull over that. Uh, of course, he recognizes or, or, or proclaims, I should say, that God is one, that there is one God. There are not many gods. He lives in a, in a world that is growingly more polytheistic. By the way, we live in a world, again, that is growing more and more polytheistic. Right? There is not more than one God. There are not all other kind of gods, and there are, not, there are not all other kinds of ways to God. The Lord is one. And because there is only one God, not many, because there is you know, Yahweh, because there is only one, you are to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Right? There is only one. I love it when, when Elijah in, in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, and, and, and he calls the people of Israel after a drought of three and a half years, and he calls the people and he says, you bring the, the prophets of Baal with you. And so 450 prophets of Baal are sitting before um, the king, Ahab, and Elijah, and Elijah says to them, um, he, he calls them near, and he says, basically, whoever is God, you worship him. Listen, if, if Baal is God, worship Baal. If God is God, if Yahweh is God, worship him. Right? And, and in other words, that which you believe to be God should have all of you. I mean, it's a rather simple but logical concept, right? If there is a God higher, stronger, more powerful than you, that who is God deserves everything. And so that which you believe that God be God should have all of you. And so that's what Jesus says here. He says he should have all of you. As a matter of fact, he leaves out no area here. He says you are to love him with all of your heart. Right? Your heart, which is the core of your emotions. He says all of your soul, which is the core of who you are, your inner man. He says, with all of your mind, which is the core of your choices and intellect, and then he says, with all of your strength, which is your will before him. God wants it all. He doesn't want an area. He's not asking for a little bit of you. Matter of fact, some of the things that we struggle with God and, and church because of that is because, wait, they, they want it all? God wants it all. He wants every part of you. And I think it's it's really truly hard to understand the depth of what he's talking about here. And, and, and honestly, we water it down all the time. We water it down all the time to say, well, you know, whatever you have, you give to God, and that's good enough. Well, God meets you where you are, absolutely. And I, listen, I don't want to water it down, but, but mind you, he's not looking to just keep you where you are. He wants to move you into him. And, and honestly, it's because it's what's best for you, because that's what you were built to do, to be in relationship with God. You were built for that. And so because of that, because of this truly radical love for God, look at what he says 
in Matthew chapter 10, which are really hard words. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 says this, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. Now, stop right there. I thought Christmas was all about peace on earth, goodwill to men. Right? Isn't that what the angels proclaimed? Peace on earth. Well, it's true, but they weren't talking about necessarily peace between men. They were talking about the enmity that exists between God and man, and that Jesus Christ was going to break that by his own sacrifice. Okay? So he says, do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. He said, for I set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Think about that. Now, how could that be? I have, well, it, it can be because as you love Jesus with everything that you are, it creates hostility and friction. It creates hostility and friction. And we don't want to do that with our family members. And so what we end up doing is we end up choosing family members over Jesus. I've actually heard people say, and I've heard people lament, and and sometimes people from the world lament, like they can't believe how somebody would choose anybody over their family. Jesus says he came in a sense, to do that. He continued on. He said, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life will lose it, and who, he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Now, <laughs> I don't know about you, but those are radical words. You may hear a sermon on that later. (laughs) I'm more deaf. But those are radical, aren't they? Jesus isn't playing here. He wants it all. Now, understand, he's not talking about not loving your family. That's not what he says. But if you love your family more than Jesus, he says. In other words, there should be no comparison in that. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And he, Jesus, listen, he fully understands that it would bring strife and it would bring conflict. And, 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 and it is a beautiful thing when a household can worship God together. That is a beautiful thing. But we don't all have that. I mean, some of us have that in our immediate homes, but not in our extended homes. You're about to find that out because you're going to get together with family at Christmas, right? And, and, and sometimes it goes okay, and sometimes, you know, they want to talk about everything but Jesus on the day that we celebrate Jesus because it's not about Jesus for them. Because it is about family and about love, and that's great. I mean, it's awesome to get together. And like I, I, I mean, I do. I love Christmas, and I love it. I love all the stuff that goes with it. I'm coming next Sunday, and I'm going to laugh hard at that movie. I'm going to laugh hard. I am. At least I, I've never seen the movie, but I love the trailer. That's the first time I've seen the trailer. <laughs> so I can't wait, right? I'm going to enjoy all the things that come with it that we can laugh at and that we can have fun with, even made-up stories about it all. It it is a made-up story. I don't know if you know that. All right, maybe, whatever. We'll get to that next week. Um, Right, all that kind of stuff, I love that with it. But listen, if you drop any, if you drop Jesus in any way for any of that, we're not doing it right. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And and why, so why division, though? It doesn't make sense. There shouldn't be division. If you love Jesus, that should cause no division. No, it absolutely causes division because your devotion, your loyalty is to Christ alone. First, foremost, and above everything. Above everything. Our devotion is to be to him alone, not to family, not to others. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't, again, we're going to talk about this, love others and all that kind of stuff, but Jesus gets it all. First time I went to Romania was, well, actually, second time I went to Romania, um, I met a woman there named Luminita. 
It's kind of interesting, right? Her word, her name means light. Luminita. Luminita was a Christian. She had been a Christian for about a year or two. I forget at that point. This was a long time ago. And uh, what we would do is we, were, we would go house to house, not make appointments with people that they knew to share the gospel. And, and, and I was the prop. You're right, the Americans were the prop. Hey, my friend from America is here, and they've, he's come, or, you know, and different people would go out with different groups of people, always with people from the church, you know, but they're here to talk about their relationship with God. Would you mind coming in? And because we were Americans, you know, this was the late 90s, early 2000s, not too long. They were still enamored with America. Maybe they are today, I don't know. And uh, they would almost always say yes. And then I would get to share my testimony. From that, and and um, but as I did that, I, I began to get to know Luminita a little bit. And um, Luminita was a young woman; she had a baby, a young child um, at that point. Who, good night, must be in his young early twenties now. It's just kind of interesting to think about. Um, um, but there was no husband, and I found out the story of Luminita getting married before she was saved. And getting into this relationship with this guy and getting married to this guy. And um, I believe she had the baby right before she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And when she gave her life to Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, it meant that she was all in. See, in Romania, especially in that time, you didn't play with God. They were still remembering a time when people would literally bust into your house church and might arrest everybody. Pastors who were taken away and, and, and persecuted for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, under Ceausescu's reign, there was like no tolerance for that. Although they sort of allowed it at times, you would be pressed down in every way. And uh, so Luminita was all in to Christ, and um, it was tolerated at first, by her husband, but it soon became intolerable. Um, and um, he began giving her a hard time for going to church and began giving her a hard time for doing the things of Christ and the gospel until finally Luminita confronted her husband or, or in the, one of these times said to him, she said to him, I love you and I don't ever want you to leave but if you're asking me to be choose between you and Jesus, I'll choose Jesus. When I had gotten there, actually it had been longer than that, obviously, because I think he had been gone like eight months at that point because he had gone out of the country to get a job and had not communicated with her except for one time. So she lost her husband in a sense, I, th I think. I don't know. I haven't kept in contact. I don't know what's happened. I, my prayer is, is he came to his senses, came back, accepted Jesus, and they're praising Jesus today. That's my hope. I have no idea, though. I, I won't find out till the heaven, till heaven, uh, if I find out at all. Um, but I loved Luminita because as I was sharing the gospel and talking about the change of Jesus Christ, as we got to share the gospel, it was interesting because as friends of hers would give... Talk, I, I eventually were able to say, let me ask you a question. Has there been a change in Luminita? And every single time, everyone would stop and go, huh, oh, there's been a change. There, there's no falsehood. There's no pretense. There's no pretending. She loves God with everything. Which then opened the door even further for that. See, she loved her Lord. It will cause strife in households at times. But God deserves it all. All right, so radical love of God. But not only that, radical love of others. Now, it seems kind of weird to even talk about this after we've just said that God is to be our first love, no comparison, right? Seems kind of weird to talk about radical love for others. And, and when we talk about loving others, it really doesn't seem that radical. Honestly, it just seems kind to do that. Right? To just be nice to people, that's what we should do. But listen, Jesus is not talking about putting a smile on your face for somebody or doing something nice for them every once in a while. Matter of fact, I'm sure the disciples, as we, don't fully grasp, didn't fully grasp the radical kind of love that God was talking about, that Jesus was talking about at that point. And he'd make it a little bit clearer, I believe, 
a little bit later on because, you know, they had heard this commandment before. I mean, they had heard this, love your neighbor as yourself. It's in the Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor. That's what we're to do. Seems pretty easy. But Jesus, later on, on his last night before he dies, would say this to them. In John chapter 10, I'm um, John chapter 15, verse 10, he says this. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Abide. You understand abide, right? It means like stay and, 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 and make house in his love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, your joy may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy be, may be made full. Now get that. God's saying if you love him with your whole heart and give it all, your joy will be made full. You're looking for joy and peace and everything in the world. It doesn't come from gathering more stuff, even at Christmas. It comes from fully being into him. And then he says this, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Now that seems like Jesus, that's pretty, like, Like, you've said that plenty of times. Why do we need to hear that again? But look at what he says, and I think it's different here, and I think you need to hear it. He says, you love one another as I have loved you. Now, that might not fully grasp on them until a little bit later, the next day and the next week, but he kind of begins to summarize it for us because he says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. See, this love that God is calling for us is not a warm, feely, mushy kind of love that he's talking about. It's not a be nice to people or be kind to people. It's a sacrificial love that we sacrifice for others in what we do. It's not, it's not good enough, Jesus says, I, I believe, to just love others as you love yourself. We don't always love ourselves well. He says, you need to love others as I have loved you. You know what that means? When you didn't deserve it. When you've done nothing for it. Right? Love means sacrifice for one another. It, it, it's, it's an action that he calls us to, not a feeling That he calls us to. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in the love chapter that we like to read all the time, I read these very often, these verses at at, um, at weddings, some of your weddings that I've done, we've probably read these verses, and they're great wedding verses, but they're not in the context of weddings. They're in the context of serving, of, of operating in your gift that God has given you in the church like yesterday. Of what happened. And so when we serve others, we're to serve them with love in action. What is that love? Verse 4, chapter 13, he says, love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, it does not brag, it is not arrogant, doesn't act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. What? All right, wait, now just think, I mean, meditate on these for a minute. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. And listen, some of you um, have been wronged greatly in life. I don't want to minimize that or pretend like that didn't happen. Love is forgiving. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. And, and we can think of it in big terms, but boy, we hold on to little things too, don't we? It says it doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all, believes all, hopes all, endures all. Love never fails. Thank God, and I mean that, that he is perfect in his love, Right? Because if it was like us, we fail in our love, don't we, at times? But when he's talking about a radical love for others, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about that radical love where, where, we, would, where we would sacrifice and, and love even when they don't deserve it. 
There's an old country song. It's old now because I'm old. Um, written by Clint Black. So in the mid-90s, uh, 1997, I think it was written by. And it's interesting because, I mean, there was a little phase in the 90s where I listened to a little bit of country music, and really, I don't really listen to it at all. I, I don't really. I don't listen to it at all, hardly. Um, I mean, it's got to be honest. I don't even know what. Um, but I think I heard this song then. I don't even remember because I've spoken this song a whole lot more than I've, than I've listened to it. Matter of fact, I, I listened to it a few years ago, and I was like, is that how it goes? I didn't even realize that was how the tune was. But Clint Black, um, I, I don't know if he was a Christian at that point. I think he's a Christian now. Uh, I think he might have been a Christian, uh, you know. But um, he wrote these words, and it, it was to his wife, Lisa Hartman. Now, if, again, if you're old, you might remember her, and that was like, this was a big thing, Clint Black, Elisa Hartman getting married in the 90s. Um, he said this. I'm, I'm going to read it. If we play it, Facebook will shut us down. So um, he said, this is the words. He said, I remember well the day we wed. I can see the picture in my head. I still believe the words we said forever will ring true. Love is certain. Love is kind. Love is yours. Love is mine. But it isn't something that we find. It's something that we do. It's holding tight and letting go, flying high and laying low. Let your strongest feelings show and your weakness too. It's a little and a lot to ask, an endless and a welcome task. Love isn't something that we have. It's something that we do. Sings a little bridge there. He says, we make each other all that we can be, though we find our strength and inspiration independently. The way we work together is what sets our loves ap love apart so closely that you can't tell where I end and where you start. It's a great picture of a one flesh relationship. He says, it gives me heart remembering how we started with a simple vow. There's so much to look back on now till it feels brand new. We're on a road that has no end, and each day we begin again. Love isn't something that we're in. It's something that we do. And he ends it with, love is wide, love is long, love is deep, love is strong, love is why I love this song, and I hope you love it too. I remember well the day we wed. I can see that picture in my head. Love isn't just those words we said. It's something that we do. There's no regrets, big or small. We give ourselves, we give it all. Love isn't some place that we fall. It's something that we do. Again, I, I just, I love that song. I listened to it again the other day and almost played it for you with a twang. I could have I shang it for you. <laughs> um, but he's got it right. He's got it so right. I mean, there's a lot of feeling and there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of passion, right? A lot, of, a lot in there. He said, but it isn't something that like just happens. It's not something we're in. It's not someplace we fall. It's something that we do. It's a choice that we make to love somebody. See, I love, maybe you want to put it this way, I love on somebody. See, when we talk about it that way, when you're loving on somebody, in the South, they actually say it that way, with a twang. You know, we're going to love on you a little bit, right? And that's not sexual in any way. That just means we're going to take care of you. Guys, you loved on the ladies yesterday a little bit in your service. It was awesome. That's what we did. We loved on people. Well, Christ is calling us to love on other people, even when they don't deserve it. As a matter of fact, it, it means that you give even when it's, when it's your turn to get. It, it looks a lot like Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. He says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. He says, do not, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also the interest of others. Now, I got to tell you, in our world where we're like, no way, I'm not going like, to let anybody take advantage of me. We, we don't like these verses. Forget about, we don't even associate, we don't like them. Because we're afraid of what it might bring us. As a matter of fact, it, it, it's radical, right? And you know why it's radical? Because it's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair that you continue to give, that you continue to love, that you continue to sacrifice, even if you don't get back. It's not fair. And you know who knows that most? Is Jesus. Jesus. 
He knows it most. He, he's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't done for us. Matter of fact, he, he, he came to die, right? John 3, 16, we love it. For God so loved the world. He did it out of love. He did it because he loves you and me. He so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten. Only begotten. Begotten means only natural born son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He loves that much. It wasn't fair. He didn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it till, still today. And what, what is the shame is that most will overlook it and step on it and reject it. Even when he offers it out of his great love and out of his great mercy. He said earlier, right, a true love lays down his life. He gives up his life for his friend. Jesus gives his life up for us. And, and again, it, so maybe it's like, well, that's not, you know, that's Jesus' love. You can't expect me to be Jesus. <laughs> um, actually, God wants you to look like Jesus. That's what he wants you to do. Matter of fact, that's your destiny. You have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, it says in Romans 8, 29 to look like Jesus, to love like Jesus. Well, well but if I do that, then, then, you know, then somehow I'll love my family less, right? So I got to love my family less, right? That's what I got to do. I love what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis said this at the end of a long letter. He wrote this. He said, when I have learned to love God better than my earthly dearest, I shall love my earthly dearest better than I do now. Insofar as I learn to love my earthly dearest at the expense of God and instead of God, I shall be moving toward the state in which I shall not love my earthly dearest at all. When first things are put first, second things are not suppressed but increased. That's why the second commandment is like the first. Love others. Love God, love others. Well, how can I? If I love God with everything I am, if you love God with everything you are, he will fill you with himself so that you will not be able to do anything but love. Now, listen, I know that's radical. I mean, we're talking radical here, right? But that's the life that Jesus wants for us. And by the way, again, as we've said, that's the example that Jesus gave for us. So the question is, have you fully embraced God first, right? It starts with fully embracing him. And then it starts, and, and then it's about setting your sights and your eyes and your heart and your, your lives on him and giving it all every day and loving him more and more every single day and recognizing who he is every single day. And as you do that, you will be able to give him all, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then you will be able to love others as yourself. See, because the way... <laughs> You are loved, and the way you realize that you are loved is the kind of God, kind of love that God has given, and so you will be able to live and love like God has loved. Look at him. Now, this is really cool because we're going to celebrate communion today, and I think it's awesome because um, this is how little I plan this kind of stuff. We forgot it was communion today. Everybody in the office. Anthony Morrow came up to me yesterday doing the thing. He says, we doing communion tomorrow? And I went, yes. <laughs> Actually, I said, I don't know. I got to think about it for a second because it was so far out of my mind. And I went, yeah, yeah, we're going to do communion. And how cool is that, right? Because we're going to get to celebrate. So I'm going to pray just to end this sermon time, say goodbye to our Facebook crowd after that, and then we're going to enter into that time of communion. Father God, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for what you've done. And Lord, your radical love and your radical sacrifice for us is amazing. It's awesome. Christmas is about you coming to meet us in that place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
Lord, may we set our eyes on you. May we, we're, we're so distracted. I'm, 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 I personally am so easily distracted from Jesus. I get enamored with so many things in this world. But Lord, help me to get enamored with you in every way. Not to take away the brilliance of the things that are beautiful, but to enhance them to your glory. I need your Holy Spirit to do that. I need to be filled every day with your Holy Spirit. I can't do it without it. So Father, may, and that happens only by me giving myself over to you every day, every moment. Lord, and the reality is, as we enter this Christmas season, as we're in this Christmas season, you're calling us to have and enjoy a radical Christmas that would radically change our heart to you to recognize Emmanuel, God with us, the beautiful gift of God. And that we would live in the glory of that so that you might be exalted in everything and others would be pointed to you. I love you and I praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we're going to say goodbye to our Facebook crowd. Um, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to get to enter into